Okay, so, oh, I've got an extra slide, I think. Uh, I, I lead a nanomaterials, uh, photonics, uh, and device research group, and uh, I'm going to try and explain to you a bit about what we do, but also why we do it. So, hopefully, what I thought my first slide was going to be will come up next. And this should be a picture of the universe, and that's because uh, the interaction between light and matter actually has given us you know, the most information about anything else that, that we can do of all the techniques. So here you've got a picture uh, of the rings of Saturn, here you've got Earth in the background, and it's the interaction between the light uh, and the materials used in these devices that are letting us see that image. However, also looking at space, uh, an image like this lets us study not big things but very small. This is the uh, absorption spectrum of helium. So looking at a star, we can actually see what the element is that it's made of using, again, the interaction between light and matter. So it's really important that we can use this. So what's photonics? Well, photonics is how we use that in everyday life to try and enhance what we do. So here you see some sort of surgeon. He's got some screens, which are photonic devices emitting light. Uh, he's got a camera up here, which is a device absorbing light. To get the information from this room to the other, there's probably optical fiber communications. And all this together is photonics. So what's nano? Well, I'm working on a scale which, if you take a, a one cent, I had to modify the slide as I'm in Canada, divide it by the uh, diameter of the Earth, this is about the uh, scale that we're working on. And at this scale, it's really important because uh, the electrons in these materials, uh, we can treat as waves a bit like light. So here's a picture which some people might say, oh, these are poisonous quantum dots, cadmium cyanide. These are not. These are actually zinc nitride quantum dots for the first time, showing uh, as we make the materials smaller and smaller and smaller, we're affecting the properties of the electrons and changing the color of the materials. So how can we use these? Well, very uh, small nanomaterials, uh, including organic ones, we can put together and we can start making devices which are very thin and are very flexible. And so what? That's great, you know. Uh, also, these materials allow us to do things that you can't do with bulk materials. So this device here we made extends what we can measure in terms of the wavelengths of light. Here we can get really clever and we can start using these very small structures to start modifying what happens on an atomic level inside something. So we can use the structure around it to change how the magnetization uh, in these materials occurs uh, and use that for quantum technology. Now this slide here uh, is a blank slide because on the PowerPoint there was a, a hidden thing. But here is, is green chemistry in action. Uh, what you're seeing here is that we can plant spring onions in soil and we can grow nanocrystals in the same way that in a lab we'd have to use high temperature horrible precursors. So now, going from crystalline materials, where we have periodic things, if you break that periodicity up, you get amorphous materials. And this is a calcogenide uh, material, which is amorphous. And what's so great about this is that light interacts with it in a much more strong way than it does, for example, uh, an oxide material. These materials are fundamental to everything you're using at the moment. So uh, memory uh, is based on these calcogenide materials, so DVDs, but also now moving on to RAM devices. So we need to try and uh, see how we can improve these materials to increase storage, reduce the cost of energy of that storage. One of the problems, though, is that if you have nano-sized memory elements, then when you're trying to write something in this element, uh, this element here can actually uh, have some leakage and cause you trouble. So what you have to do is prevent charge traveling through the one you don't want it to. That's quite tricky to do, especially in these calcogenide materials. And this is the only science bit, really. And that's because the bonding part of the uh, uh, material has no effect on the where electrons are conducted. And so these materials are p-type. And for 40 years, people have tried to make n-type to make something called a p-n junction. Uh, it was very difficult to do. What we decided to do was use a national implantation facility to make the material first and then modify it afterwards. And we actually managed to achieve our goal. So what you'll see in the next slide is a measurement of something called the Seebeck coefficient. And this is a true test in an amorphous material of whether it's electron transporting or hole transporting. So above the line here is n-type, below the line, sorry, is p-type, below the line is n-type, and as you can see, we've managed to get down here for the first time in 40 years. This is absolutely uh, great, because what we can think about doing now is combining the great properties of the electrical uh, things in these materials 
we've also the optical. And here we've done it. So here we've taken a glass material, which people don't think should conduct electricity. We've made what's called a PN junction out of it and shown it acts like a detector. So this is a really, really nice work, because what we can now start thinking of doing is merging the two things together. So what's the link with Canada? Well, we're also now starting to work on materials which are used for X-ray absorption. This is an ANRAD detector made in Canada, which is used for detecting cancer and taking X-ray images. So we're trying to make these thinner, more efficient, and even flexible in larger areas. Ultimately, we want to go to some sort of architecture where we have our materials, where we can store some memory in it. We've already got detectors now. We're now working on making light sources all in one material on top of the silicon to achieve some of the efficiency gains in thermal management in these devices. Now, I'm not sure what will happen now because, oh, I've got a quantum slide, good. So uh, finally, what we're doing is working in uh, the area of quantum where we take a very pure material and we want to put uh, just three dopants in exact position uh, placement. What this allows us to do is control the spins of these things called qubits by looking, using the excited state of this one. And uh, the UK government's been very kind to us and has just given us uh, some money to make a new tool to do deterministic single ion doping at the ato atoministic level for the first time. Uh, and so this is a bit of a hot topic in the UK and it's uh, well supported by uh, many people around the world. It's now flashing, I've got a final slide. So this is uh, a logo for a project we have going in the UK on antimicrobial resistance. So it's really important that as scientists and engineers we engage in all the major issues affecting society. And so we've been given some money to give out to engineers and physical sciences uh, researchers to work uh, in this area. So I'll take some questions. You showed a, a slide where you did iron implantation to change from change the doping type of the chalcogenase. Often when you go to high implantation levels for crystalline material, you cause more and more damage, so it becomes lower quality. Do you get around that because you're starting with an amorphous material? Yeah, so you're starting with a totally amorphous material. Do we get around it? Um, well, we, in we introduce more defects. Um, but yeah, you're right. We don't have that crystallize, crystallization problem to start with. Uh, it's good and bad. It means the mobility is lower. Uh, but actually also means that we can use the material to actually create energy. So we can use it for photothermal, uh, you know, CPAC uh, effect to actually create energy. So you can put it on top of your chip and your computer and create uh, scavenge power using that method. So it swings and roundabouts. Oh, Anna's got one for me. The second part was all about these chalcogenides, and I mean, obviously they're a great material, but they do have issues in terms of toxicity. So, I mean, is uh, can you make these materials that are safe? Okay, I'm going to pull back on that. So, toxicity is a, a property of not just the material, but actually its form. Uh, so, the most famous chalcogenide is arsenic trisulfide. Uh, it's a glass, and in the glass it's been shown to be non-toxic because the toxic element arsenic is held within a glassy matrix, so it's fine, you can put it in your mouth, lick it if you want to. The same for the uh, GLS material there. Inside your computers, you've all got geranium and timony telluride memory devices. Uh, again, in the glassy amorphous state, it holds it there. That's why people working on nuclear materials want to actually make glasses to hold radioactive waste, because they're actually really good. So as long as they're big, and you're not uh, inhaling them as 1D type materials, then the health effects actually are minimal. So in the elemental form, absolutely uh, toxic. In a glassy structure, uh, proven to be non-toxic. You can grow bacteria on them and everything. Even when you're heating them? Well, when you're heating them, you kill most things anyway. Uh, the temperatures we get to uh, during our deposition work is maybe 80 degrees max and nothing comes off at that temperature. The glass transition temperature for these is about 340. For phase change in your computer, it's about 140. So we're nowhere near the point at which we're disassociating the atoms. They still remain bonded and can't escape individually as elements.
So you were showing a novel type of photo sensor or mm -hmm. photodiode. Uh, can you? I, I didn't catch what, what was the novelty or what is the benefit of well, that? Well, okay, so the, the novelty is that it's made out of glass entirely. So uh, this glass is highly nonlinear. And so what you have now, you can make waveguides out of this glass, you can make lasers out of this glass, optically pumped lasers. You've now got detector made out of this glass. We're now working on making an LED out of the glass, and it's compatible to go on top of silicon. So the idea is then you can have uh, a completely uh, uh, you know, glass matrix on top doing all the communication stuff with silicon driving underneath. So replacing semiconductors, essentially? Uh, not replacing, complementing, I would say. Yeah.